We all know that HR professionals are the backbone of our organizations. They do ensure that things run smoothly, that everyone is well supported, but it's really important to make sure that they are supported too. And we know that this role comes with significant challenges. Personally, because I, I'm connected with HR leaders, HR professionals on a daily basis, I know that they actually face long hours high stress, and there is emotional toll of managing other people's problems all the time, right? Let's face it. So I know it can be really overwhelming to juggle multiple projects and at the same time to ensure the well-being of your entire team. It's not easy. So and sometimes it can feel like there's no end in sight. So my question for our esteemed panel, and I'll start with uh, Marvin, Marvin, what do you believe are the primary causes of burnout uh, for HR professionals? Um, thanks for throwing me in at the deep end. <laughs> yeah. um, I think there's, there's obviously I think, a few issues. <clears throat> One is the constant barrage of information, the, the constant the, 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 the digital noise, the digital overload. But every time you log into LinkedIn or something, there's somebody, somebody else like me telling you what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, this is the new trend, and there'll be a tech company somewhere obviously wanting you to invest in their new tool. So there's a lot of there's a lot of noise around the sector. Um, I think that your the, the HR's responsibility for the overall productivity of the workforce or uh, the general well-being of the workforce itself isn't easy because people have a lot of different pressures um, and different generations within the workforce have different expectations. I've been saying for a number of years now that you know, on interview, people have to get used to answering questions like, you know, how do you support me if I need help? Uh, five years ago even, a question like that would just be, you know, but now it's, you've got to be able to answer that. Um, we have moved into an era where I call them. We've moved away from management and direction. When we manage before, we manage this, we direct that into support and enablement. So people have support. Enablement is they want access to the knowledge, the skills that, that they need to know as and when they need it. They don't want to be put on training courses. They want to learn things about their own place as and when they feel they know it. Um, and I think that the, the, in general, uh, what we find is that a lot of the research I do, which is around the kind of employee experience and employee retention, uh, <clears throat> meaningful, if you read my latest piece, kind of meaningful workplace experiences. This is what people want from work. Uh, and it, it's, it's, you know, for HR to be able to, to uh, if you like, orchestrate that uh, isn't easy. Um, but I think that uh, if, as long as people know, effectively got it back, as long as they know that you know, they can turn to you for support, they can turn to you for direction, that you're an organisation that supports them, that's interested in their well-being, that knows that, that you have a role to play in their well-being, and their well-being will impact their productivity and how they feel about you and how they interact with their colleagues. Um, it's not that you're being pulled in a lot of directions. I think that it's, uh, I'll let Colin talk about recognising the signs of when things maybe are getting a bit too much. But I think it's just generally being there for that support and that people know that they've got somebody they can come talk to uh, and talk in confidence um, and, and just know that they can have that conversation and you're there to help. Yeah, it's interesting that you've said that because the very first time I heard about uh, your story, Colin, I felt so much inspired. And uh, I don't know if you would be open to share with us a little bit of your personal story when it comes to, to burnout. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, hi everyone. Um, great to be here. So, I, fantastic introduction. I talk about broken multiple times and, and fix myself multiple times. Um, and just what Mervyn said there, burnout is a number of things. We all know when we're pushing ourselves a little bit too hard, we feel the effects, and I could recite them all, pretty much know them anyway. But equally, 
burnout is a point where you also can become symptomatic of an underlying health condition. That could be a musculoskeletal, it could be a mental health condition. My condition, I was born with the OCD uh, and anxiety disorder. Um, I've also got ADHD, but that hasn't actually been a problem for me. It's been a real superpower for me, so we'll call up that one for now. But OCD is a very misunderstood condition. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder. You obsess about a number of things, more so than someone without OCD, and you, you ruminate and you, you feel urges to, to fix whatever it is you're panicking about. So if you can imagine, someone mentioned fight or flight, I think it was yourself, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Fight or flight. The fight or flight mechanism is there to protect us when we're in extreme danger. The more stressed we are, the more active it becomes. And if I push myself too hard over an aggregated and continual period of time, um, my fight or flight mechanism can, can trigger a pretty much everything. So imagine someone running in here with a, with a shotgun, everyone would have a reaction. You run, you hide, you scream, someone might fight. That, that system is there for a reason. It's to keep us alive and to survive. So we have 50,000 thoughts a day. You probably only remember 10 of them. So imagine with a very, very active fight or flight mechanism that wants to react in the same way as someone with a gun for something that most people would just process and forget about, I would go into panic. I would then want to do something about it. And if you think of the um, stereotypical OCD, which could be hand washing because you're a fear of contamination, germs, dirt, etc. Your brain says, oh my God, you've got dirt on your hands. So you've got to do something about it. So wash your hands. By doing that, unfortunately, when it's an irrational reaction to something you shouldn't really be uh, reacting to, it sets it up into your mind as something that you are concerned about because you wash your hands in the first place. You give it some meaning. So we'll think about it again. So you wash your hands again. You'll think about it again, and you'll wash your hands again. And then when you wash your hands, your brain will go, did you wash them enough? So maybe just do them again. So, and, and it, it got to a point where it was jumping across everything and completely debilitated me on, on numerous occasions. Um, three times now, I've got to the point where I've been so unbelievably savage by OCD and anxiety that I've reached the end. I didn't want to be here anymore. But on those three occasions, I found the, um, the fight and the impetus to, to say, no, I'm not going to let you get me. So I then went through all the processes throughout this journey. So at the age of 10, when I first presented with um, OCD, I worried that I was dying of HIV and AIDS, which is a little bit wrong. And had there been mental health professionals in schools um, and colleges, I would have reached out to them and I would have had a, you know, saved a, a lifetime of hurt. But that was the first time it happened. So you can imagine just going through life having these situations. So I thought, no, um, I'm going to have to, I've got to sort this out. So every time I had problems, I went on a journey with therapists um, and I learned and I put it into practice. And some of it worked, some of it didn't. And then I fell over again. So I learned more and then I tried different things. The last one that took me two years to recover from was the pandemic. It absolutely destroyed me and it destroyed a number of other people. Some people won't even know that it, it had the effect on them because we do tend to, to hide these situations. Um, and it was only by reaching out to the doctor to say, I've done everything I've learned before, my cognitive behavioral therapies, my exposure response and prevention therapies, um, all of my breathing exercises, all of my meditation, and I am still broken, that I went on the medication route. Something I tried in, when I was 25, and I had a very, very, very difficult time with it, so I about never to do it again. But I needed that, just that little extra help, which then allowed my other <coughs> mechanisms and coping strategies to work, and then it all fell into place for me. So everything I've learned by breaking has been learned from other people and trying and error and doing stuff. Um, but it's got me to a point where I know how to get back. So I now know what to do to not go there in the first place. So I'm a prevention rather than cure. I'm not a, an accredited psychologist and psychotherapist, but 
better I know as much as they do, because with an OCD brain, I just went massive into research. I understand it inside out, like, right, and what to do. But I now know what I need to do to keep myself away from what I call the burnout route. And it's the sting drives of human comfort and stress. If you have a great relationship with it, you won't have the difficulty with stress and burnout. And I think we'll have uh, the, the opportunity to tell us more about this uh, sitting drivers because the first time I saw this, I was uh, on a LinkedIn post, I was like, oh my god, it's such a holistic way to approach it. And uh, yeah, it will be great to tell us um, more um, uh, later. I want to go to Felicia now and just to ask uh, Felicia, I know that the burnout shows up and I mean, we have had this conversation so many times, burnout shows uh, in so many of the projects we are working on. So as a service provider, how do you navigate this conversation? Um, you know, I thought about that question earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I did as a professional is I actually uh, took some time to study um, counseling as an art because as um, someone who's meeting with people from across the globe, and you're speaking about work to start with, holistically, if you take a holistic approach, there are other triggers that are going to arise. So when we speak about the individual, it's not just the workplace and what happens in the workplace, it's how I become aware that other sensitive issues are coming to the surface and how I redirect that. So to your point, understanding what is happening in the context of the conversation. So that's the first thing that I decided I would do. But I'm a massive learner anyway, so I'm, I'm constantly learning just for the sake of knowing and understanding. Um, love studying on the brain and of course the underlying psychology is behind it. Um, and then also individuals. So I've worked with people from as far as Brazil and then India and everywhere in between. And the, at the core of it, we're quite the same. So as much as we see people in passing and we figure out what makes them different just by sight, at the core of it, we're quite the same in terms of who we are on the inside. Um, so I've become, like yourself, kind of collecting um, data, information, similarities in terms of what I hear from people. And um, one of the things I hear is that at our core, most people do try to bring their best to the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I start there, and then I try to understand, okay, what is putting us, bringing us off kilter? Um, and that's where we get into overwhelm, stress, anxiety, because all that is, by the flight, is our body telling us that something is not right. And it wants us to do something about us, about it, sorry. And the more we ignore it, the deeper it manifests. So if we get to the point of overwhelm and burnout, we haven't said, okay, well, hold on a minute. My chest feels tight. Why is that? Uh, my breathing feels erratic. Why is that? And I'll give you a good example before I finish. This is a lovely venue, um, but for me, slightly claustrophobic. When I first sat, my brain started to panic, I promise you. So even before, as Hendra did her amazing exercise, I was quite calm, I think, on the outside, but I was sitting here mentally walking myself through a process of calming myself on the inside because I literally wanted to go and stand over there because I just felt so closed in. I wanted the windows open again. So it's just being aware as I speak to people, what are the triggers? Where are the anxieties manifesting from? And how does the workplace either contribute or support you? So many times I meet um, employees by our programs and they, when we talk to them about the triggers and the patterns, they say, so many of them, they say, yeah, but wait a second, what if I'm not even aware that I'm stressed? How do I ask for help? Or how do I know that I need to, to practice this thing or that thing? So it really starts with self-awareness. Um, so you really love what you've said, uh, Felicia. And um, just to uh, ask you, Irina, about the burnout, well, we had a conversation the other day, that, and, and you mentioned that it, it actually becomes an increasingly relevant issue nowadays. Um, so 
what is burnout from your perspective and why is it, it has become so relevant? First of all, uh, thank you all for being here today uh, for this important discussion for each other. It's fantastic to see so many professionals in one room. Uh, so, uh, we are living now in a time of few challenges, constant changes. And this dynamic environment is transforming uh, business models like never before. As you know, all HR are at the center, at the heart of this transformation. Mm -hmm. And they are play, playing a crucial role in uh, navigating this shift. Uh, as many of us, uh, HR professionals uh, <coughs> tend to be like perfectionists, <coughs> always aiming everything ourselves, and we are to this highest level. This uh, maybe it's very good, but. Uh, also lead to burnout. Mm. And, uh, there are five uh, main reasons uh, why HR uh, experience imbalance and burnout. There are first unfair treatment at work, too many tasks regular pressure and tough deadline, uh, a lack of clarity. What you just said when it comes to the signs of burnout, because um, this can be really alarming, um, especially given that, you know, within our role in HR, we have so much to do, we have to navigate through conflicts and to make sure that we have a, a very good work-life balance within their teams and a great culture, uh, while at the same time, you know, there are certain goals and certain KPIs we need to to achieve throughout a certain period of time. So it's really challenging. So I guess my question is, you know, when it comes to explore and try to understand the early alarming signs of burnout, what are the most like Talk from your experience, and um, if you have what kind of preventative measures you think we can use so we can help um, our HR professionals thrive. And I would like to start with you, Irina. You can speak a little bit louder. And uh, what are the signs of burnout? Right? What are the signs of burnout? And especially when it comes to helping people to take action, how we can help them to spot those, identify those early enough. Okay. Thank you for such an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, I have recently discussed this topic with my HR colleagues. It is important to maintain uh, four uh, major areas mm -hmm. in our life. There are our body, mm -hmm. this includes our sleeping, patterns, healthy, nutrition, physical exercise, our activity, uh, this includes uh, our achievements, education, career, uh, our communication. This involves our friendship with our narratives, family, friends, and other close emotional connections. And uh, finally, our purposes. This involves our future plan, targets, value, fantasy, dreams. Any deviation from standard approach of this for major areas of our life, <coughs> this is already signal uh, for appropriate action in your taking. Yeah. 
Thanks for sharing. Uh, Marvin, um, what's your take on this? And more specifically, what do you think are the main alarming signs like of burnout um, from your from your experience working with so many companies? I was going to say I'll give this one out to Colin because he's the expert, but I will give my perspective. We'll have a go in a minute. Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, based on, I suppose, the research and stuff I do, uh, yeah, there, there's a sense of disengagement. Right. So it's people, it's not always easy for HR people to detect, but in the workplace, particularly if uh, you're an organisation that has you know, an element of your workforce who might work remotely, hybrid, flexibly. Um, but there's a general disengagement with what's going on around colleagues. Um, I think that there's a, a, a kind of a, a, a... You also notice people, I wouldn't say doing the minimum, but I mean maybe not pushing themselves that extra bit. Um, and that could be because they feel that they've been taken advantage of, they feel that there's maybe too much meat to them. Uh, they maybe feel they're carrying the can for, you know, they might be one of the team of four or five, and they, you know, that we all know that thing, like, I'm doing everything, and no one's really helping me. Um, a lot of that will lead to burnout, uh, feeling that certainly at the kind of time we are now, if I can, I suppose, move what topic for a second, where everything that you see online is about you know, AI and, and kind of how it's going to change everything. Um, there's a lot, almost a feeling of being overwhelmed. People kind of, if you're overwhelmed by something, you tend to switch off from it. Um, obviously some concern as well, the, the, the particularly people in, uh, I suppose, marketing areas and things like that, because you, know, see, you don't have to read much about chat GPT to know everybody says, well, it's going to take away what marketing does, it's going to take away what, you know, this is how people can learn in the future. And, and, um, so I think there's a general feeling that, you know, that everything's moving maybe at a different pace to you. Everything's maybe getting a bit too much. And you don't feel on top of what you're doing. You don't feel part of the community of the organisation. And that, and that is particularly if you have of your workforce, as I said, you work flexibly, remotely, hybrid, and synchronously. It's very important to maintain connection. Uh, one of the huge problems, as you probably know, is for people newer in the workforce, connection and connectivity is how they learn things, how they pick up from colleagues. Uh, and it's very easy for people to join the ground sound because they don't feel that they're really learning anything. And that's Possibly no one's particular fault other than we're not uh, we're not kind of overseeing how you know everybody gets information, everybody connects, and then how that's being shared. So I think I mean I've, I've come up with quite a few things here. But mm -hmm. I mean it's kind of it, it's it's a general malaise. Right. And I think it leaves people feeling that they don't really have agency mm -hmm. in what they're doing, in how and when they work, in kind of the decisions being made around. They tend to kind of work out. Right. Um, can't agree with you more, Marine. And I feel like when it comes to uh, working remotely, working in a hybrid setting, and making sure that our employees are really connected and bonded, I feel like, uh, Felicia, when it comes to that, this is your bread and butter. So, what kind of best practices do you grab on them? when we have uh, employees who work in different kind of settings or different parts of the world even to make sure they work together both as a, as a members of the same team right yeah um you know there's there's so many thoughts so i have to have to narrow my focus but thank you for the comment marvin about connection mm -hmm. because if you think of a traditional workplace where we're all in the same building what usually happens from a social perspective. We come in, we greet each other, humans are social beings. Um, we have, uh, even if it's 30 seconds, we have eye contact, we can communicate, and that makes our brains happy. Um, if it's lunchtime, we have somewhat of a friend, doesn't have to be a best friend, but we can go out and maybe grab a, a quick sandwich, and we're connecting with somebody, so all of that creates a feeling of happiness and, and comfort within the workplace. And unfortunately, 
what we have now is we have an environment, two things, where we're constantly overstimulated um, because of technology and we're constantly tied to our workplace. There's no separation. So years ago, you would get up from your desk and you'd go home and then that was it. That was it for work until you got back on Monday morning, right? There wasn't any messages popping up while you're trying to have dinner with your loved one, um, changing your mood because instantly your mood switches. And then also, um, we try to draw a line under the pandemic, but we haven't really addressed what that looked like. So what I see is that those who are hybrid, virtual, all types of arrangements, they have their calendar slammed every hour. Every single working hour is filled with meetings and calls and conversations, when in reality, that's not that's not a productive working place or working environment. And that's partly because during that time where we couldn't see people, unfortunately, we didn't adapt our leadership capabilities with trust and understanding of what was supposed to happen. So job description said, oh, you're here to service your customers. But then I can't see you, so are you servicing your customers? How do I define what that looks like? Is that 10 calls a day? Is it 50 calls a day? So we have this completely overstimulated environment in the workplace and coupled with the fact that we change the way we work and we're not connected. Um, but we are so lots of isolation, um, lots of, and unfortunately, lack of understanding of how to communicate. So if I'm annoyed, I'm gonna fire off a spicy message and reply to you because that's easier than me saying, well, I'm sorry, I'm not picking on you, <laughs> than me saying, well, listen, Lisa, um, I don't, you know, I don't really understand the point that you were trying to make. That's a different communication than firing off a spicy email and reply. So I'm going to cut there because I could go on two hours. And it's interesting what you've said about digital uh, well-being, really, because in many cases uh, when we speak to partners for the very first time about how important it is to introduce some kind of interventions on this topic, they don't get it. They say, oh, you know what, this is a nice to have. It's not that important. But then we, what we say is that, you know, so many people are struggling with digital addiction. It's a real thing. So as an employer, an employer of choice, let's say, right, how do you actually better support your teams to navigate that? Um, so I guess my next question uh, uh, to you, Colin, is about uh, people and so many times I hear from some employers saying, you know what, we have some top talents within our organization who never break. They are like uh, the superheroes, right? And we don't need to worry about our senior leaders because they already, they have built up with silly. Nothing wrong with that. And I was like, okay, interesting. So what do you think about that? What would you respond to that? I'm not going to swear, but I'm called, I'm called, I'm called bullshit. <laughs> because anyone can break. Anyone can break. So if you consider a car and you sit there revving the engine, it's a supercar, by the way, so it's got all the best equipment, the best manufacturing, the best engineering, and you sit there with the pedal down, and you leave it down, eventually it's going to blow up. So some people have the ability to tolerate more. This goes back to behavioural profiling and when you sit in various uh, behavioural profile sex sections, um, they just generally have a, a, a more resistance and resilience to, to stress. But every single person um, could, if they want to, break themselves. So uh, yes, arguably leaders tend to have a um, more resistance to, to stress, but then they're put into more stressful environments as a consequence of their ability to be able to manage stress. So it's quite relative. And that is why after the pandemic, there was an incredible report that around 70% of CEOs had claimed they had their first mental health experience, ill health experience during the pandemic. Now that for me, I feel it's because one of the drivers is control. You need to have control of your environment. And leaders predominantly that might sit in, if you're looking at the disc profiling, a high D, a dominant 
and need to have their control over everything they're doing, everybody was on a level playing field. We lost it all. We were locked up. <laughs> we were not able to exercise. Our teams were disparate. The government was saying that we couldn't go outside and breathe because we were probably going to catch something and die. You know, our businesses were having massive challenges and difficulties and we lost control. And then everything else that went associated with that. And another one is, uh, is loneliness as well. Loneliness breaks a lot of people. If you're used to having a stage and you're used to having teams around you and you, you lose that, that can have a, a massive effect on you. But all of this is compound and aggregate. There's not one thing that will make you break. It's a combination of, as I'd say, 15 things that all will aggregate together and get you to that point. So every single person in this room and every single person on the planet, about that point we said, we're all made from the same stuff, yeah? And I know we have differences, but at the core, it's a chassis with some organs and a brain, yeah? And if we want to, we can whatever. <laughs> Um, okay, next up, uh, in terms of uh, what you said about the, the driver problem, I just, it's interesting that um, I was just thinking about a survey from uh, Deloitte the other day, which shows that 77% of employees, they have experienced at least once uh, burnout at their current jobs. Uh, and I was thinking, oh my God, there's more than seven out of 10. Uh, this is this is alarming so i was then thinking okay if that's the case then what are the best strategies so we can actually be proactive about it and you you've said about your your model and the, the driver so would you like to, to share a little bit more yeah yeah there's there's a combination of things first of all understanding self-awareness you mentioned it earlier trying to understand where we are as individuals and what is going to you know maybe put us into position and what can challenge um, there's another really core area to this is we've got three psychological systems. We've got a drive system and our drive system, our get up and go, we get rewarded every time we deliver something with dopamine, bodies love it, it's addictive, that's why we want to push, 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 push. So we have to give our people permission not to break themselves. I'm working with the Liberal Democrat Party at the moment and I've got the CEO tell the whole organisation I am giving you permission not to break yourself in the run up to the general election. Really powerful statement, but everyone then learned, oh, maybe I can be a bit self-aware. Maybe I don't have to push as hard as I think I need to, because you all represent organizations. How many times do you say to your workforce, right, I want you to push so hard that you break today? You don't, but people do break because they feel that they need to push harder. But that goes back to the dopamine. We are addicted to delivery. We've got our threat system, but when that triggers a lot, then we go down the route of ruminating and trying to solve, 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 which actually triggers our drive shift to solve it. So you get into this like massive um, uh, awkward situation. And what I love what you did at the very start, which is part of a soothing system and exercising your soothing system, go back to your car. If you were to sit there with the, the, the engine jet, but put the biggest fan and cooling system on the planet available to that vehicle, it wouldn't blow up. So this is why I educate people to, to exercise their soothing system, meditation, sleep, and um, all the things that you can do to take some me time, me time exercising and everything else. But what I learned coming back from the edge, and any, everything that gets me to a point of being symptomatic of my OCD and anxiety is exactly the same that everyone else puts themselves through to get to their type of burnout. That could be the control or delete where you literally can't function. Yeah. And then you've got all of the interesting symptoms that you'll experience on, on the way up there. But there are 15 drivers of human company distress. I could recite them all, but I need just that raggedy piece of paper in my pocket because my ADHD brain is on two, three, four questions ahead, unfortunately. Um, so, but I'm going to do it. This is the most travel piece of, um, of of technology you're never going to see. But there they are. There they are. I'm going to read them out. So these are all the things I was told by everybody to fix myself, but I needed to do well to get better. So it stands to reason if I do them well in the first place, I'm not going to fall over. Concerns about health, finances, relationships, purpose, demands, control, change, 
support, that's your support environment that you've got around you. Treatment, that's going back to bullying, harassment and um, victimisation. And then we have rest, exercise, diet, excess. So that's partying hard, yeah? Fun, equally partying hard, but not so hard, but, but building fun into your life. And compassion, which is one of the things I learned so much about. Being compassionate to other people releases serotonin in you and them. So if we all run around being nice to each other, the world becomes a better place. We feel great, they feel great. So these are all the things I educate people on. That if you've got a poor relationship with a load of those, you're heading for a problem. If, however, you can do better with all of them, and you maybe still feel that you are having difficulty because you can't maybe nail some of them, Finances is a great example, because we can't suddenly change the mortgage rates back because the banks are responsible for those. Therefore, people are having a difficulty with finances. But if you can pick the ones you can do well with and do them by X2 or X3, so you do more exercise than you would, your normal exercise level would be, you can buy yourself a stress credit. So you can offset some of the stress that is ultimately going to build up and make you fall over by doing some of the things that you can do well and more often. And this is where I now calibrate myself and educate everyone else to calibrate themselves. Know who you are, know how you're made, know why you're having these issues in the first place. Yes, there's CBT and ERPs and all kinds of therapies you can go through to help you understand and fix the symptoms, and that's a different conversation as well, but to stop being symptomatic in the first place be self-aware, get yourself in a great place, look after yourself and look after others, and you're in a, a very, very fighting chance of being okay. Is that slide? Yeah. Uh, I have discovered such effective uh, strategies mm -hmm. around, uh, first of all, uh, maintain uh, work and private life, delegation, uh, realization of the tasks, Secondly, being a part of HR community, I'm a member of the social community, <laughs> share my challenges and my achievements with my HR colleagues. And finally, uh, continuous learning education for myself, uh, improving my heart and soul skills. My personal motto is learning. <laughs> this is what I do. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that you said that because I was thinking the word is psychological safety, and um, you, you spoke about being part of community. So yeah. from my experience, what I've seen that works really well within organizations is when we actually organize uh, women's circles or men's circles, where employees come together with a great facilitator, and they are open to actually share. Uh, some of their challenges when it comes to their mental health. And by creating that kind of safe space, uh, we are actually better able to prevent and overcome burnout. Um, and, that, um, and, and I would like to ask also Marvin about that, about effective strategies when it comes to burnout. Um, I think being there for people, so if we're talking about HR people within an organization, if your people know you're there, mm. uh, checking in regularly, not obtrusively, uh, but oh, just uh, but checking in, you know, how are you doing? Be a simple, how are you doing today? How are you? Is everything on your mind? Is there anything I can help you? Is there anything I can support you? Uh, it doesn't have to be intrusive and personal, it needs to do with work, it needs to do with anything. Um, Thinking back to when I started work a long, long time ago, I was a trainee accountant, and we had something that worked for a firm of accountants. The partners and managers were very invested in. They kind of knew what you were doing, they knew your hobbies, they knew, and they, 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 it was a very different time. You know, the, the office hours were 9.30 to 5.30. Uh, there were about 150 people worked there. But, you know, at 9.22, there were probably about five people and everybody came in and by 5 40 they didn't expect to see anybody you know. and lunch was an hour and you were supposed to take it and go out and see it as we were um, and we've kind of lost that in the 80s and 90s a bit um, greedy school and all that 
Um, but it, it's kind of that, kind of not putting too much. And see, perhaps we're also asking how you work, how are you getting on with things, you know, is there any help you need? Uh, and we don't really do that. There was a personnel person there, one, for, uh, uh, he did really pretty cash and pay slips and things in. Um, and he kept all the contracts. Uh, but it's that just, just, just being there. Be a, let, letting people know that they can speak to you um, and that you're there to help for any support they need. And, and I think that's, that's, that's all it needs to be. So it's to be that listening ear, but it's also to be yeah. listening as the support network or as part of the support. Yeah, uh, I love a lot of what you said about the support network because it, it brings to mind that, you know, soft skills like active listening or showing compassion to our colleagues now is something that uh, I think many managers doesn't come natural to them. It's something we need to teach to show them how. Um, so, yes. But that's something yeah. that comes to promoting people. Mm. for the right behaviours, yeah. not promoting people because they're bringing the most money or they work the longest hours mm. or so they make the biggest noise in the office about how great they are. It's promoting people who are actually you know, benefiting everybody around, doing things to help people around them and help the organisation. And that's what true leader means at the end yeah. of the day, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah. Um, amazing. So Felicia, what do you think of uh, the model? I know that you use a specific model with your clients when it comes to, to burnout. So would you like to, to share more about that? Yeah, so it's amazing how aligned this panel is. Let me just say that in terms mm -hmm. of um, similar but different approaches. And um, we, we saw kind of the 15 areas to kind of focus on or to manage. And in the bags, I've actually put um, what's called the wheel of life, which is a similar approach, mm -hmm. certainly not, not the same, similar approach in terms of um, understanding which areas of your life are out of balance. And then also uh, for individuals who are, you know, kind of being promoted, I just want to say that before I forget, um, I often say to people, listen, it's common that we promote people because they're subject matter experts at SME. So, and in one of my presentations or my talks that I do around the evolution of HR, I say, Jim's been there for 20 years. Oh, Jim, you still work here? All right, let me give you a promotion, right? Um, so a subject matter expert then has to learn, hmm, I haven't been promoted because I'm great. I've been promoted because my company wants me to create more of me. So that is the approach that I use when I'm speaking to people. Um, and to tie that in terms of how people are settling into the workplace and avoiding that burnout is being clear about how much you are doing in the workplace and not trying to fix people, particularly from an HR perspective. So again, in my talk on and the evolution of HR, payroll, so that we were payroll clock at one point, and if you got paid, wonderful. If not, you know, fine, I'll fix it. That was it. And then, of course, more and more kind of uh, functions got added to um, the payroll department and the payroll department became personnel department and the personnel department then became, you know, either human resources or human capital. So it's evolved and it's going to be more and more critical for HR practitioners to know what the resources are in the community mm -hmm. so that if there is a financial challenge or if there is a marital challenge or if there is, you know, something that to refer reference for, for a counselor perhaps or, or a practitioner that we kind of speak about passing on the employee or connecting with a resource instead of trying to absorb all of the stress that comes with 100, 200, 500, 5,000 employees. That's going to be more and more important because you have that book, like again, when I first started work, they gave you a big book and you sat there and read it for a week. Right? It's going to be more important to have that from a technological point of view. These are your resources and make sure that people understand if I need help in this area, this is where I uh, can get that support because my human resources team has provided that for me. Amazing. 
Thank you for sharing with Felicia. Uh, so that leads us to the last question for today. Uh, and this is what single actionable advice that you would like to share with the audience when it comes to dealing with burnout or any kind of call to action, anything that you would like to share as uh, now we're at the very end of our panel discussion. And, and I'll, I'll, I would like to start with Irina. First of all, we need to understand that all questions are our mighty. External influence factors influence uh, our brain. Positive events influence uh, uh, happiness hormone process and otherwise negative events making us unhappy. This take account to acknowledge both your strengths and your weaknesses. Where you draw your resource, your energy. Remember the balance model I have mentioned before? Keep focus your balance wire for major area, body, action, communication purposes. I'm sure you all know this golden rule. During the turbulence flight, put on the oxygen mask yourself, first of all, and then support your child. This statement is true for a child when you please. First of all, support yourself, and then you can successfully complete all tasks. This is why. Yeah, it's a great reminder, isn't it? It's simple. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Marvin, what's your actionable piece of advice? Um, understand the moments that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, recommend if uh, people read a book called The Power of Moments by two American academics, Chip and Dan Heath, uh, where they talk about the power of individual moments and the, the the, what I talk to people about is experience of work, and, and we have to accept that there will be negative experiences. There's nothing we can do about that. But the, the, what their research shows is that the, the impact of a negative experience is usually quite sharp. People are really mad. Peed off. Um, positive experiences don't have the same, it's just a better, it's just a smaller kind of um, the thing is to, you know, we have to accept the bad things happen. There'll, there'll be negative experiences. Uh, with the world, there's a lot of it, so much about, you know, the universe, you know, the world, and it's maximizing all that. Now, it's a matter of maximizing the, the, the good moments, because the positive feeling is not as strong as it is, but it lasts longer. And it's the things we need to remember. If something bad happens, three good things happen. They remember it's good days, isn't it? And, if they're, they're, and, and, and you, and they will see the role you play in that as well. So it's kind of like understanding. Did you agree, sir? Can't agree with you more but when it comes to the positive and negative experiences, the intensity of the emotion is so, um, yeah, so, so different. I, I mean, yeah, disproportionate in, in a way. And uh, Felicia, any tips, any advice, any kind of best practices? You would like to share that? I think for me, um, is the understanding that high performance does not mean running head first into a brick wall. <laughs> if you look at it from a, a sports perspective, and that's another conversation I can spend hours on, every high performing athlete has a few things rest and recovery, um, physio support, coaching support. Without a doubt, there is no top performing athlete that does not have that in their regimen. So we really need to get to the point where the workplace understands that high performance is about a cycle of activity, not about pushing ourselves until we drop. 
And so what I use is I use two processes. One is in vision. So in I N vision, that is who we are at the core of ourselves, what we like, what we don't like, what makes us tick, um, how we can push ourselves, where we need to back away. And that could be a CEO might need to step backwards and do that work. And then actuate. That means now I'm ready to influence others because I understand how to best navigate myself and how to give others my best. So those two processes, envision and actuate. Amazing. Uh, I love the analogy with the Olympian athletes. So, you know, we work with many Olympian athletes with, uh, with being oxygen. And that's something I've learned about how important it is about rest and recovery time for them equally important as it is to go and train hard. So uh, I love that you mentioned that. Um, and you call in any best practices, any tips? There's thousands, but I'll, I'll zoom in on one that I hope everyone will take away. Yeah, it's so, number one. <laughs> turn off your autopilot as frequently as you can. The reason I say that is if you look at a plane or cars that can drive themselves now, those autopilots are mass developed and they've been trained and developed and educated to fly a plane or drive a car. Unfortunately, in humans, our autopilot hasn't been trained and it gets it wrong most of the time. And certainly when your fight or flight mechanism is triggered, it takes you down a very primitive journey, which is to just do something to save yourself. So I would urge people to, to switch that off because if it's untrained, it's going to take you down a path that you never really needed to go down in the first place. The reason it activates so much is the more stress you put yourself under. I call it Jedi mind tricks. It's telling you to do something to try and solve a problem that it thinks is a problem, which isn't really a problem. It was never built, and our brains have never really been set up to deal with artificial intelligence, pandemics, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, all the stress and the strains of life we've got ourselves under. It was never conditioned for that from the start, so it has to be trained. And when it's untrained, it takes you down the wrong journey. So I switch off the autopilot, look at yourself, self-awareness. What is troubling me at the moment? How do I deal with that? What can I do differently? Rather than run down this kind of artificial path my brain wants to take me, although your brain will tell you it's right, because you trust your brain, it tells you to breathe, doesn't it? So you trust your brain, but on this occasion, unfortunately, it gets it wrong time and time again. So switch it off, get that control, think about what's going on, think about how you can do something differently to where it was going to take you, take control, take that moment, and you will be in a much, much better place. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. So I know that we covered quite a lot, uh, but I was just uh, want to ask, do you have any questions for our panelists? And if yes, please feel free to raise your hand. Any questions? I do. Yes, of course. Um, I'd like to um, see what's the vision for that from the traditional HR structure and for the new one that we are seeing now, that it's not more HR system in some uh, job description, for example, it's people coordinator. So what is the difference? And it's really true that it's going in that way or some institutions, some organizations are still holding back to the old style that doesn't allow people to actually be more uh, vibrant, I'd say. Well, I'll say it's a one line. Um, they're people. They're not resources. They're not personnel with lives, with ambitions, home screens, uh, situations. And the, the, I think the, the concept of a kind of people leaders, leader managers, is that it identifies that they are people, everyone is an individual, and they need to be treated as such. You know, we can't, we're, we're not, I don't know if anybody here is HR in a factory or something, but the old assembly line kind of thing, it, it's not, we, we don't work in those environments. I doubt anybody in this room does, if you do what 
apologise. Um, but the, the, it, it's understanding with the people, so we have to treat it differently. So yes, to, to take it away from kind of personnel and staff and human resources to people, I need mean, not managers, but, but, but you know, the people leaders is, is uh, it's just a mindset, it's a different way of looking at it, but once you look at it from that, maybe you'll do things differently. Amazing, and I think Felicia would like to add something to that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, from from what I see, because some of each, some of the HR professionals are actually coaching clients as well. So I see two levels of relationships. So relationship up, that is boardroom C-suite level, entirely focused on metrics right now, profit and loss. And some of that is again, I'll be quick um, as a result of recovering the losses experienced during the pandemic. So for HR. Uh, communicating in profit and loss terms why decisions are important. That's the one thing I see that's going to be a, a significant challenge for HR to communicate differently in a profit and loss terminology. And then from the employee level, uh, again, creating that pool of resources. Because if, really, if, we, if we think about um, maybe 20, 30 years ago, you might have understood one or two terminologies where people were neurodivergent or different. Now there's a plethora of terms that we have to be aware of and sensitive to. So understanding how to create that library of resources without overwhelming yourself to understand in detail every single one. Thank you. And Colin, you said you want yeah, to... Yeah, I'm chipping. I'm worried about the, the future, to be honest, because we're all in a room here talking about burnout because of the prevalence of it. You know, it's increasing, so we're not getting it right because too many people are breaking. And I think that is, follow your point, because we're sweating our asset harder to get more productivity, more for less. It seems to be the mantra, more for less, more for less. How can I sweat my asset and get more value out of them? Which is a bad way of looking at it. And it's a conversation I unfortunately have with people is how can I sweat my asset without breaking my colleague? And it's like, well, it's kind of the wrong language, but at least I'm, I can save this situation. And, and that, that's a real problem for me. Um, and I would be adding to sort of what you said there around talking commercially about profit, yeah, risk. Talk about the risk to losing people. We've got the presenteeism and the absenteeism and, you know, happy workforce is a productive workforce. But if you remember three, four years ago when the, maybe a little longer than that, the France telecom executives were taken uh, on corporate manslaughter charges because they went for a major company transformation, sweated people too hard and suicide rates went up. They went to prison for a year because the suicide rate went up because of a change process that was too tough. So when you start talking as HR leaders to CFOs and CFOs, talking about the reputational risk of an incident, an accident, people that are not necessarily bringing their own game fall off ladders. They fall into tankers, yeah? So I think we need to step up we need to be talking about risk, business risk, commercial risk, people risk, financial risk, reputational risk, to get people to go, actually, I know I say on my website, we value our people. We actually have to get them to value their people because that's another thing I've got to bullshit on, to be perfectly honest. The, the stuff you read about organizations, that they say they do when they don't actually do is, is horrific. So yeah. step up. Thank you, Colin. So I just want to say that uh, our, our lovely speakers will stay here during the networking session in case you have any questions uh, for them. You can ask them on a one-to-one -one basis. I'm just conscious of the time. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being part of this insightful panel. And um, your advice has been really, really invaluable. I uh, just want to say that um, we uh, here at Oxus and we would like to extend a special invitation to each and every one of you in this room. Uh, in case some of you haven't uh, uh, built your employee wellbeing strategy this year, the 
entire year. Uh, we are here to help. So we, in your good bags, you will find some flyers about the off-site, some amazing off-site events we organize for our clients. And we give a 25% off for every single one of you in this room. Uh, so you can just contact me directly on LinkedIn and you'll get your discount code. That's the one thing. Second thing I want to mention is a white paper on the future of work. We produced it recently with Fortune 500 companies. It's been featured on forums, and you can download it by just taking a photo of the QR code here or on the flyer you will find on your goodie bags. Um, and the last thing I want to say, I'm really, really proud and so excited because recently I launched um, Oxygen's mini book and planner um, it's a it's an amazing planner when it comes to building self-awareness and um, you can find it on amazon so it's, it's here um, and also i have a copy here in case you want to take a look so i hope you really really uh enjoyed our panel discussion i want to give special thanks to our team here at oxygen especially to napa maria paul and more specifically i want to give big big thanks to liberty towers uh, they helped us to bring this event to life and i'm so excited uh, that we got the chance to work together special thanks to tatiana and luke and uh, massive thanks to Homeground for partnering with us again this year. Uh, if you want to find out more about how to get a membership here, I can bring you in contact with the memberships manager. Um, and uh, yeah, last but not least, I hope you really enjoyed the panel discussion. We're going to have some cannabis, some nice non-alcoholic wine um, and uh, yeah feel free uh, to connect to spread yourselves around the room and keep having the conversation going um, so shall so we give a round of applause to our lovely speakers again.